Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to a new Houston Sports Weekly podcast as uh, we inch closer to the uh, holiday season. We're getting there and a lot going on this weekend in the world of sports on the uh, college level, professional level. Also, we have a little high school football going on as well. Welcome to Houston Sports Weekly. I'm Randy McAvoy alongside Ari Alexander. Thought we'd spend a few minutes with you and uh, get you updated on what is happening across uh, Houston and weigh in on our, some art takes as well. Um, because there's a lot to talk about from the Astros, Texans. We got North Shore playing. Uh, we are not lacking anything here on the on the sports scene. Let's start with uh, the uh, Astros and just the free agency Ari in baseball because that's got a lot of attention this week. Um, let's begin with Carlos Correa. This everybody saw this. He was going to land somewhere. Yeah. He left what a year ago. Got that deal, the short term deal with the Twins, but he had the opt out, and everybody said. No way he's staying in Minnesota. Sure enough, he's not. <laughs> but uh, he he kind of bet on himself, and it's it's paying off with that big deal with San Francisco uh, with the Giants. Yeah, it's funny because he he had this long career in Houston, right? Played seven eight years for the Astros, and then he's at the one stop off in Minnesota. And now he's going to be if he doesn't get traded, thirteen seasons in the Giants. Yep. And so it's like years from now, right? You get the the throwback Carlos Correa Minnesota jersey is going to be a collector's item. Absolutely. He was just there the one year. Uh, he bet on himself, you're right, and it worked because $350 million is a lot of money. It's something like the fourth biggest contract of all time. It, the AAV, the value of it per year is not as high as he would have gotten for the Astros last season. Mm-hmm. But from talking to a bunch of different player agents in these last couple weeks, they're not necessarily looking, most guys, or at least the younger guys, are not looking at that. They're looking at the total value of the contract. At the end of my career, how much total money did I get? Mm -hmm. And in the last 14 years, if we're including the Twins, $35.1 million they gave him this year, he's going to get $385 million Mm. total. So that's money that he can invest and buy houses and whatever. And so when Carlos yeah. Correa retires, he will have made $400 million in his career, which is you, an insane you amount can of money. feed your family on that. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. so you think about that, and you get that big number. So yes, the $27 million a year he's going to make is less than Alex Bregman's making this year, by the way. Mm. And it's less than, way less than Aaron Judge is going to make this year. But the total number is one of the biggest of all time. I mean, he's going to San Francisco. People, uh, the funny thing during this whole process, I thought was uh, when the Dodgers were in the conversation, and I, I guess he reportedly met with them. But then the Dodger fan base went crazy, saying, "There's no way you could bring this former Astro yeah. here," blah, blah blah. Which I thought was stupid, but um, but still, I mean, it, it didn't work out for whatever reasons. Uh, I don't know if LA is going to regret it, but that's a pretty good rival of theirs. And now he's up the road to, uh, up in San Francisco. Well, from I've heard from the LA side that they really like Gavin Lux at shortstop, and they weren't mm-hmm. super in on a lot of these guys. And there's only one left now, and that's Dansby Swanson, who I don't think is as right. good of a player as Trey Turner, who LA had and is now signed a three hundred million dollar eleven year contract with the Phillies. And so you've now seen the three of the big four shortstops mm-hmm. are signing massive contracts: eleven years, two eighty for Xander Bogarts; eleven years, three hundred for Turner; thirteen, three fifty for Carlos Correa. And it shows this is what the price of having an elite shortstop is. And it begs the question, and I know it's a long time from now, but when Jeremy Pena comes up in five years and he's 30, and I, I imagine he's going to get better as he goes on, he's already won a gold glove, he's already won World Series MVP, I was thinking at some point Jeremy Pena is going to be a $100 million player. Well, yeah, I would think by the time that comes around, he's going to be a contracts. $200 million player, a yeah, $300 million absolutely. player. The number's going to keep rising, but... Uh, I guess the Astros, they you know they certainly missed Carlos, but man, what Pena was able to bring, man, people still love Carlos, but they kind of forgot. Like hey, we're okay, we got Pena, up and comer, MVP. This guy's life changed, and uh, hopefully for Pena's sake, and I think he will. You and I have been talking about that. He's going to work hard this off season, and he's going to be ready, and you know. Hopefully adapt. They, everybody knows his strengths and weaknesses now and how to attack him. But, man, boy, did he 
prove everybody wrong and uh, get it down in crunch time of the playoffs. Yeah, and, and guys get better as they go on throughout their career. I mean, yep. you saw Carlos Correa when he was a rookie and he was skinny and yep. you know tall and skinny and and then now I remember the first look at him. Yeah, it's like this guy's got to put some uh, weight on. Yeah, and, and he was fine a few years later. Which Jeremy Pena does not need to do, but now <laughs> Carlos Correa is built like an outside linebacker. Yeah, and and all those like skills that he had as a young guy, where he had a little pop, he had probably the best, maybe. O'Neal Cruz might have passed him, but Carlos Correa, I think, probably has the best shortstop arm in the history of the game until probably O'Neal Cruz now. Yeah. Rated, you know, 80 grade out of 80, and it's just the perfect arm. And he won. It took him a little while to stay healthy and win the gold glove, but he Mm -hmm. won a platinum glove in 2021. He hits for power. He's never hit 30 home runs, but you know he has 30 home run power. It's just the staying healthy. Right. And so all these, these people that say, like, oh, the Giants overpaid, no, they didn't. That's what a premier shortstop costs. Yep. He had a 140 OPS plus last year, 40% above league average, playing shortstop excellently, mm-hmm. and for the most part was healthy. He only missed time because of COVID, and then he got hit in the hand by a pitch, which can happen to anyone. So right. the injury-prone label, I think you can take it he's, off of Correa. I agree. I think he's past that. That was the early concern early in his career when he was coming up through the ranks. And he was the shortstop. Is like all right because he had what the like, I recall like a back problem, lower you know, back lingering back problem. thing. Yeah, and people were like, "Oh no, is this going to be an ongoing problem?" Well, he, he got over that hurdle and missed the time and rehabbed it. And to my knowledge, that really wasn't even a problem after that. No, he only missed. I mean, yeah. he played almost every game in 2020. Yeah. He played almost every game in 2021, and then this year he missed 26 games. And like I said, got mm-hmm. hit in the hand and missed some time. Had COVID and missed some time, but that's not back yeah that's different things so astros uh, off season uh, they continue now and you know they said after the announcement of jose abreu jim crane jeff bagwell said we're not done yet so we're still waiting for some more deals i, I still think they're going to happen but uh wilson Contreras went on uh, he was on the radar obviously a guy they were interested in he ended up signing with with st louis to, to be the replacement for yadier molina um they're looking at some other catchers as well. Do you? What do you think? Do you think they're still going to try to land another catcher to pair up with Martin Maldonado? You got to have somebody, obviously, but somebody good. You don't necessarily need it because between Jiner Diaz and Corey Lee, if you're splitting time and yeah. and you're doing it to the trade deadline, this is what they did this year with Jason Castro, and then Castro mm-hmm. got hurt. Is you're going to have Mar- he's since by the way now since retired. retired too, Congratulations yeah. on a tremendous yeah. career for Jason Castro, Castro the Astro. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you got what 100 games right till the trade deadline roughly. So you need 55 of them Martin Maldonado to play, which he can, and then you need 45 games from Diaz and Lee or a combination of. I really think that if they don't sign someone, that Diaz and Lee can play combined offense and defense at a relatively backup catcher league average level for 45 games. Right. So they don't need a backup catcher, but the list is starting to dwindle. So I have this. Uh, I have a free agent list. I have a Google sheet. Oh, Excel fancy. document, fancy. Yeah, yeah, with uh, colors and everything. Oh, nice. So uh, Contreras gone. Gary Sanchez is left. He'll be expensive. Christian Vasquez just went uh, to the Twins uh, for $10 million a year. Yep. Zanino went. So your guys that are left right now are Omar Narvaez, who's an okay defender, ex-brewer, can hit a little bit. Kirk Casale, who just got brought up to come back to um, the Giants and kind of not a big hitter, can play a little defense. Mm-hmm. Here's a guy I like, Tucker Barnhart. Tucker Barnhart was a starter for the Reds for a long time, won a gold glove, yep. not a very good hitter, played with Detroit this past year, had a bad year. But yeah. he's like a backup catcher he, right. who you could get for $6 million a year or whatnot. Cheap and still be productive and yeah, that's be like adequate defensively. Austin yeah. Hedges, Sandy Leone, Kevin Pulecki is another guy I like, uh, and then Sean Murphy got traded to uh, Atlanta. And Roberto Perez I don't think is, is really at that level. Like If you sign a Roberto Perez, it's not any better than Diaz or Lee. But like... Yeah. Kevin Ploiecki had a kind of a rough year. He came up with the Mets, was a second-round pick, played with the Red Sox for a little bit, played with the Guardians for a mm-hmm. bit, um, and then a bit with the Rangers this year. But, like, that's a backup catcher. But it's mainly those kind of guys that are Yeah, you were right not now. looking at I mean, yeah. unless, Gary Sanchez is yeah. the only guy left. Right. And he had some past ball issues, which is something yeah. that's been brought up with Corey Lee. And so at that point, why not just let Corey Lee play if you're going to try to go out and sign Gary Sanchez? Yeah, Corey, um, the sample size to me when he came up, you know, obviously he struggled offensively, went back down to Sugarland, right? Hit really well in Sugarland. Yeah, went especially back down. was it immediate or did it take a week or two? And then he took a week re- or two, and they started hitting. Bombs. Then he regained his stroke, and he finished really strong at, as the season ended. right? Yeah, he did. So, um, 
You know, he's a guy that still, I think, needs another good look or two. I mean, a 45 game, but if you're splitting yeah. those guys, Diaz and Lee, you're right. giving, let's say, Lee 25 games and Diaz 20 or something like that. Yeah. Are the Astros really going to struggle? Are they going to have three catchers, though? Maybe. On the roster? Because Diaz can I mean, play a little first in DH? Yeah, it seems like that's a, I don't know. It seems like that's one too many that you need if you can apply it elsewhere. But you could also have one of the guys, I don't know how many call ups they've got. They probably have several left that they can go up and down if needed. But cause you want them staying sharp, too. Right. Whether it's Because they might not wherever. play a whole lot. But if, yeah. you're, if you're trying to build out their 26 man roster, right? So we know the six man rotation. I would imagine Hunter Brown is up. Yep. Right. Yep. So all those six guys. So. so you have I mean, your geez. your six pitchers: Presley seven, Montero eight, Abreu nine, Stanek ten, Neris eleven. Uh, you're gonna probably have a lefty. So like one of these, Blake Taylor, Parker mm-hmm. Mashinsky is twelve, and so then the thirteenth pitcher. So now you have your thirteen hitters. You have your starting nine. So the four guys on the bench. You're gonna have a catcher, either Lee or Diaz, probably Matajevic, Hensley. Um, mm-hmm. I assume they signed someone else to be a full-time DH left fielder. The Michael Brantley reunion seems like a serious possibility. I think it is, based on the way Bregman was talking when he was here at Houston Life. Yeah. Not on Houston Life, but we were talking. He he seemed, when he was talking about the lineup, he was like going through it where, like, where Diaz would play. Um, and uh, uh, I bring you, I'm sorry. And uh he was like, yeah, no, Brantley can hit second, as if it was like, <laughs> yeah. no-brainer, he's coming back. And he went so. on the trip to Vegas with all those guys. Yeah. Uh, Alex Bregman got invited to uh, attend a UFC fight this past weekend in Vegas, and so yeah. he brought David Hensley and Kyle Tucker, and they were hanging out with Adam Frazier, who just got I, signed. I saw that picture on the plane. Wouldn't that be pretty cool, just to be on the plane, like a fly on the wall on that plane, man? That would be pretty cool. Yeah, should get a private jet. And, uh, <laughs> I think it's good to be Alex Bregman. Absolutely. So some changes coming, uh, hopefully some more additions. Still, it's, very, it's still December. I mean, they're gonna, they don't open camp for a couple months anyway spring training so um, a lot of moving parts out there Jim Crane does not want to hold back he wants to win and that's so unique because it's not like that every major league city the owners aren't about winning some of them they just want to get by and make money well, Jim Crane wants to make money. He wants fans in the stands. He knows he has to have a good team for fans to come to the ballpark. Yeah, there's some owners that want to win. So the the New York Mets currently have uh, like $80 million in luxury taxes, which mm-hmm. is more than the payrolls of six teams. So wow. they're paying more tax than six teams are paying total to build a whole team. Yeah. And I think Jim Crane, is he's under the tax. The Astros are like $198 million, The tax is at 233 so he's said, you know, if we need to go into the tax, we'll go into the tax. Mm-hmm. They haven't done anything to do that yet. So I'm kind of not really taking Jim Cr- I think they want to stay under the tax. Mm-hmm. The good thing for the Astros is they don't have very many things left to do that they need to go over the tax to yeah. be competitive. They need an outfielder that can hit left-handed, which you can get Michael Conforto, Michael Brantley for... 17 million, like at most, right? right? And then a backup catcher for 6 million, and yeah. then, you know, some minor league signings. So you can spend good. 27 million, still be under the tax. Good, good position to be in. All right, we're going to take a break here on the uh, Houston Sports Weekly uh, podcast. We've got a lot to get into. We're going to take a two minute break. And when we come back, uh, we will uh, segue to talk a little Texans, you think? And, uh, Rockets and North Shore. Rockets, football. North Shore's going, and uh, kind of whatever else is on our mind. But uh, this is Houston Sports Weekly podcast on KPRC 2, 2 Plus, and click to Houston. Com. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Houston Sports Weekly, our weekly podcast here at KPRC 2, 2 Plus, and also on click2houston.com. Welcome back. Randy McAvoy, Ari Alexander with you. Good conversation on Astros baseball and kind of how things are going right now over the winter and maybe potentially some other moves coming your way. And we'll do that a lot over the next uh, several (laughs) weeks because, hey, they're the world champions and everybody wants their fill of Astros uh, news and notes uh, during the winter break. But we're going to segue now in these final uh, handful of minutes here on the podcast this week. And uh, let's begin with the Texans now, Ari. Uh, They're beginning now the final month. Final four games of the season, right now sitting at one uh, eleven and one. Yep. Uh, man, they should have had that second win. They had that game in Arlington. Man, uh, <laughs> if they, they had to score inside that five, and it would have been over. They would have put them away. That would have been one of the shockers of the NFL season, taking down the Cowboys. But uh, they did a lot of good things in that game. But that was a point right there when you're inside the five, you get denied. That cost you. But offense wasn't great. But it was better with that rotation, and then uh, the offensive line didn't allow any sacks. You know, there were some takeaways from that, but it's just a, it's the story of the season. They found a way to 
not win a football game. Well, they're they're a very bad team, and that's what happens. Uh, shout out to everyone who played Chris Moore uh, in fantasy that week, uh, last week, who had a phenomenal 10-catch, 100-yard game, and then mm-hmm. he scored like 25 DraftKings points for Chris Moore, which is awesome. <laughs> Jalen Petrie had that, like, just stick on... Um, I forgot who he hit real hard. It was like Zeke. And then Jonathan oh, Owens. It was, uh, no, it was on uh, C.D. Lamb. Yeah, it was our guy, friend Lamb. of the program, C.D. Lamb. Yeah, no, he, he man, he got his bell rung on that one, man. He, uh, you know who else got his bell rung was Gallup. Got lit up by Jonathan Owens in the end he zone. Did. No, he did. Which great Jonathan great Owens hit. is not a big guy, but he's very like solidly right. built. And it's, so he's like 5'11", 205. And he just like, that was a great. It's good to see those guys, those safeties. Yeah. One, Petrie is from here. He's from Stafford. He's a hometown mm-hmm. kid. Mm-hmm. And he. He, um, NFL Network did a whole segment on him because of how well he played, just kind of going through the film and, and showing, yeah. like, look how good this rookie looks. And then yeah. on the other side, Jonathan Owens, and we talk about him a lot, um, you know, as as Simone Biles' fiance, <laughs> but he's such a great underdog story in the NFL. He's a kid from St. Louis, mm-hmm. from a private school, one of the small schools that, uh, you know, they're not playing the highest level of high school football. Right. Like, those schools are getting killed by North Shore, yeah. right? Oh, absolutely. And they had to go- work harder to yeah, get Yeah, and then he goes level. to, like, Missouri yeah. Western State and goes undrafted and bounces around on practice squads for a while and then gets his opportunity last year and has this phenomenal game where mm-hmm. he had an interception and a fumble recovery, and it's like, man, this guy's a little undersized, and he's undrafted, but he can kind of play a little bit. And so the Texans gave him this role this year of, you know what, Mm -hmm. this is our team, you're a starter. And he earned that starting job, and for the most part, he's, you know, there's some deficiencies that he has. I mean, he's not a lockdown guy, but he's been been playing pretty well. He's been durable. And he hasn't, they're not losing because of him. No. You go 111 and 1 no. and it's not Jonathan Owens' fault. He's going out there, he plays hard, he does the right things, he does the right things in the locker mm-hmm. room, and he's just one of those stories that I think if you put him on a good team, he would be a good help out with special teams, rotational snaps at safety, a useful guy on a good team showing that he's one of the better players in that defense on a bad team right. that he could help a winner. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's definitely had some his moments this season and uh, you know, it, but this is a team, let's face it. Uh, they're going to get the number one pick, counting yep. down. And I think, see, one. I, was count, I usually like to count each day. I think it was one. I think we're one, day one thirty three now out from the. How do you know that? I I look it up. April twenty seventh. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> no, I keep up with them. I think it's one hundred thirty three days up. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Because I think last night I said on the air one thirty four. Okay. So, uh, it's either one thirty three, one thirty four out, but. <laughs> Hey, just Google days until April 27th. 59 plus 31 is 90 plus, we got, what, 16 days? So that's 106 yeah. plus 27, 130. Yeah, wow. So you're doing some serious math. I just Google how many days till <laughs> April 27th. That's, you can do it a little quicker. Yeah. Uh, but, no, everybody's looking towards the draft in, in April, late April. They're going to get the number one pick. And uh, what are they going to do with it? They're going to get a quarterback. They're going to bundle it and trade it and try to get some more picks. Who knows? Um but what's going to happen when the season ends? Uh, who's coming back? Is it the whole staff's going to be? Is Lovey and everybody gone? I would, you know, I would love to see Nick so. Casario gone, as, as people know, but it's not going to happen. I don't Big I don't, anti-Nick Casario guy. You know what? I, I, here's the deal. Um, and I did a post that got some pop from, from fans. They were angry, too. He's just he, – Casario might be the nicest guy and, for all I know, smartest guy. I, who knows? But he hides. He he he's, he doesn't come out and be accountable for this mess that everybody's looking at as a football team right now. Uh, I think fans need to see the general manager of the Houston Texans more often than they do. That's just my take. So I'm going to play devil, devil's advocate on that because like yeah. they're one eleven and one. Yep. Let's say Nick Casario came out every four weeks and did a press conference. I think that would be great once a month. But but like by the third. One that he does by week twelve when they're one nine and one or whatever they are. Yeah. How much do you really want to hear like, ah oh, man, we're staying the course? No, 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 no. Here's here's my point on that. I'm saying that once we knew it was going this bad and he's got his handprints all over this roster. I'm not saying since week one do it. I'm saying when we knew this was going to be a train wreck. Just come out a little more often. That's all I'm saying. 
I'm not saying week one all the way through the end of the season. That would get old. Plus, he doesn't tell you anything. Right. He would also have to change that approach too. That he'd have to become non Bill Belichick. Well, that's what he'd actually yeah. give us something. Well, he I think he uh, does it a little differently. Belichick doesn't say anything because Serio says a lot of things that don't mean anything. Right, and he you're just like scratching your talks head. Talks in a circle. Yeah. Yeah, you know what businesses are like out in the. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the tech world tech word world. salad, and then it, it kind of leads to nowhere. And like the direct oh. question will be like, "Tell me about the running back room." And oh man, when Apple started in a garage in 1974, and well, he, he likes to do that. I'm just saying, you know what? I don't need a lot of him, but just more, just be accountable, man. And um, but I don't see Calvin Nair making that move. That's just me wishful thinking. But uh, yeah, I, once I, he's grilling burgers again. Yeah, I know exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I do think that Lovey's gone. I think they're going to clean house on the staff. I think they have to because they're about to get the number one pick, and there's they've taken steps back this year. They didn't even hold the course from last year. It went backwards this year, and so you, you, I think that rebuild process is going to take a little bit longer. I mean, I don't think Pep's a very good offensive coordinator, which hurts. Um, yeah. And Lovey... Although he had his probably best game against the Cowboys. Yeah, they well, because they were just but mixing up, throwing random stuff against a team. rotating quarterbacks yeah, out there. thought running. that they were going to kill the yeah. Texans. Right. Um, but no, he, he hasn't earned a second year. Lovey hasn't earned a second year, but the issue I think that presents, this is where I'll agree with you where Nick Casario needs to take some blame, is you have now hired two coaches to be caretaker coaches, to be transitional coaches, Mm -hmm. to look over a bad team, to hope to build some culture, the word they always like to use. Let's build some culture, let's get some good guys in the room, and then once we start to get more talent, we're going to get a real coach and we'll do the thing. And he's now 0 for 2 on a caretaker coach. Mm -hmm. You're not even trying to win. You can't even bring a head coach in here to just like look after the guys. You've screwed up those hires. Like I get when most general managers around the league are hiring a coach to win. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those coaches fail and GMs get fired. You're not even doing that. You're just hiring a guy to like be competent, yeah. and they're 0 for 2 on that. Well, I, and I think that's one reason. I think uh, there should be more more criticism. It's not all on Nick Casario, in my opinion, but he should be receiving more criticism than he does, I think, locally. And um, be accountable for what you just mentioned, some of these hires that are really not paying off at all. And it's like, do it's a simple thing for me. You're moving forward. You you've taken steps back as an organization, which is sad to see because it was already really bad. Uh, you couldn't even really improve on anything this year. And now you got to. If I'm Cal McNair, I'm saying, okay, these two coaching hours didn't work. Do I simply do I trust Nick Casario on this next major step for this organization? Because if you screw this up in April. And don't get guys that that hit home runs for you. Where are you then? Yeah, because now you're trusting him with a third coaching hire, likely. Yeah, and the number and one posi- overall. All pick. these new position coaches coming in, like right. O line was it Warhop, the O line coach? Yeah, and it's the third O line coach in three years or something yes. like that. Yeah, I mean it's just you got to get to a point where you got to be he's, consistent. Uh, and I looked have at his. Uh, I looked at his. Um, not to pick on George Warhop, I looked at his uh, resume, and yeah. he's been a coach. Uh, uh, position coach for a long, long time, yeah. on, and like never on a winning team for like he's well thirty respected. years. He is well respected. He's been around the league. He's just he's your guy that is just, the O line coach on a six and ten team. Yeah, they're just got to they're exactly at the point. Where there's stability and there's improvement in the right direction for the organization. So, anyway, four games left to start with Kansas City Chiefs. We on spent Sunday. a lot of time talking about the Texans are bad. Yes, we have. It's, <laughs> it's really depressing, man. We're in December, and it's like we're, we're counting the days till the season's finally right. over. But, hey, got a couple minutes left. Uh, we've talked Astros, Texans. Uh, U of H has a big basketball game Saturday at Virginia. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they bounce back. Uh, they had that law, tough loss against Alabama. They're going to be fine, big picture, but uh, it's, it's another great non-conference test for the Cougs. I hate the way Virginia plays, and... I, I hate that whole, that defensive slow, it's like Wisconsin does it in Arizona, try to do it yep. even though they had good athletes. That, like, the pack line defense. And you can ask NBA guys, they hate players that play at those schools yep. because it is the opposite of what you're taught to play pick-and-roll defense in the NBA. So these guys have to basically get brainwashed clean and then relearn how to play defense in the league. And so I hate pack line defense. And so with Virginia-Houston, uh, Kelvin Sampson teaches rebound hard, go after 50 50 balls, and mm-hmm. sometimes shots don't fall for Houston. This could be like an ugly, like 52 46 game because Virginia plays My slow, bit. disgusting yeah. defense. It's getting a lot of attention. Virginia's what, three? Are they number two now? Are I they think. two now? Yeah. Okay. 
Cougs are number five. So even if the Cougars lose, I don't see them dropping a lot. I, think, I mean, I think they stay in the top. I 10, like right? that they're playing really good teams in yeah. conference. Like, how? What better yeah. way to get battle tested than to play Alabama and Virginia? Yeah, the high ranking's great. They're playing some good teams, but Tampson, everybody else, hey, it's all about conference. Just take care of business in conference, get that championship, and be playing really good basketball in late February into March. You're gonna be in good shape. Got about a minute or so. Last stop. Uh, let's get a little love to the North Shore Mustangs. Play for six A D one title Saturday night against Duncanville. Uh, no shocker, North Shore's back at Jerry World. They made a habit of it under John Kay. But uh, this rivalry's become a good one. I think it's the f- maybe f- fourth time, I have to count, I think the fourth time they've played over the last handful of years for a championship. So Duncanville, North Shore, always a big matchup. I mean, Duncanville is obviously really good. You look at the, those rosters on those teams, those guys are sending 100 D1 guys, right? Yep. Like, it's terrifying how yep. good they are. North Shore is a fun story this year because last year they won a state title after losing Demetrius Davis with a freshman quarterback, right. and then he got hurt, Caleb Bailey, and now you have a receiver, David Amador, who I, I love this kid. Great story. I think he's one of the more underrated recruits in the country, and he's going to... Uh, UTS- U- I think it's UTSA, right? UTSA, he's committed I committed to him right now. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, he, I think Power Five schools should go after this kid. He's, he can play. He's a, he's a player, man. Uh, I was out there on Monday. Got chance to a chance to talk to some of the guys. They're, they're locked in. They've been there before, and they'll be probably they're projecting uh, anywhere from forty five to over fifty thousand there Saturday because the game behind before them is um, going blank, guys. Local, uh, it's a local Dallas school playing. Um, It'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, in the 4 o'clock game, they're expecting a who just a massive crowd. Katie. Is that uh, who it is? Oh, Van, yeah. Vandergriff and um, South Oak Cliff, maybe? Oh, uh, maybe. Might be South Oak Cliff, Dallas. Okay. I think it's Dallas School. And they're the defending champions. So they're going to have a huge crowd for that. And uh, biggest crowd I've ever seen there, are, and I've been a lot of them there at, at that stadium, was when Pearland played Euless Trinity. Okay. 2014, 15. Uh, Tony Heath was the coach. They won the state championship. They were given no chance, and they upset uh, one of the best teams in the nation there. And there's 54,000 there. Wow. It was amazing. So, anyway, we are out of time on this week's Houston Sports Weekly. Thanks for hanging out with us, talking Astros, Texans, Cougs, and a little high school football. We'll do it again next week. Uh, every Friday, a new episode drops here on Houston Sports Weekly. So, enjoy it. And thanks for watching. And if you're just playing out and listening, thanks for doing that. As well, we'll talk to you soon. Happy holidays to everybody.